Hey everybody, it's Brian Nutter from Summit Racing here. I am doing a live stream today with Judson Massengill from the School of Automotive Machinists as I knew it. It's now known as SamTech. Uh, we do these you know, live streams nearly every Friday and it could be with a it could be with a vendor, it could be with a racer, you could be customers, it could be a tech subject like last week we you know had a thing on pinstriping. Uh, so it's a lot of you know fun things to do here but you know one of the the better parts of this job is i get to see the comments from all of you from really all over the world you know and uh you know just tell us your name where you're from uh and any kind of tech questions you have uh we've got some people back in the the uh studio there that can kind of you know put some of your comments and, and everything up on the screen so that judd and i can uh see them and then we'll try to answer those as well but Anyway, thank you for joining us here today. And with that, uh, Judd, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, Brian. Um, Brian didn't mention that he came to school here. We'll start off there. It was a nice meeting. And matter of fact, in Denver, wasn't it? No, Colorado Springs. Which one? That oh. was actually up in, in Denver that we were doing. Fact, that. Yeah, it, was. it was the Vizard Engine Building Conference. Yeah. And I was just getting out of the... Uh, uh, Air Force at that time, and I was looking for a way to get into the racing industry. And then I attended this conference, and I see, you know, School of Automotive Machines. I'm like, ooh, that could be fun. So I sought you out after those, you know, that three day conference, and you you popped up. And uh, yeah, six months later, I was uh, down in Houston with you guys attending school for the first time. And what year was that? Ninety six, ninety seven. Yep. So started off, uh, basically got out of the Air Force in, in roughly 96. Uh, and uh, as I remember it anyway, just you know, kind of made my way over there and I wanted to do, at that time you had two main courses and it's expanded since then. So we can talk about that a little bit later on in this segment, but you had the block course, which you started off, off everybody in the block course. And then from there you had the cylinder head course that once you got through that, so. It was a really long program too. That each of these were nine months, so it was a year and a half. This wasn't like some, you know, six week little, you know, kind of get to see something. This was a full fledged, uh, you know, you didn't have the associate's degree back then, but you know, darn close to it. <laughs> um, for those of y'all that aren't familiar with the school, my my wife uh, uh, was obviously her idea, as most things around here are. <laughs> but uh, uh, I had a machine shop, was building a lot of engines, uh, circle track and drag race, uh, some road race, just, you know, everything. Uh, and just couldn't get any employees. You know, where do you get a machinist, you know? And Linda and I were, were eating one night and I was just griping about, you know, you can't get good help. You can't. And she says, you know, there should be a school for this. Okay. And I said, there's no school for, you know, engine builders. And she says, well, we need to build one. And I can promise you that if it wasn't for her, it wouldn't be here. <laughs> it was four or five years, you know, going through the government, jumping through hoops and everything to get all this and hired. And, oh my gosh, it was a disaster. But anyway, uh, we did it and we're here today, 35 years later, uh, we've grown some and all that, but it started in 1985 because my machine shop, we couldn't find good help. That's what really got it rolling. And, and today it's the same thing. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, um, any of the good machine shops today, I mean, even, you know, um, with the environment we're in right now, they're going 90 to nothing. I mean, just, uh, it's incredible. I guess a lot of people are getting ready to race when they can. Uh, we're getting out there a little bit now, you know, we're gonna have a national event, NHRA national event here in Houston. So that's good. But um, anyway, um, we, we're a hands-on school, you know, uh, we're going to bore home balance. Uh, you're going to start in orientation and I don't want to get on a soapbox or anything, but I'll tell you a problem we've had for 35 years. Okay. And that's math skills. Yes. Now forget about being a machinist. Let's just talk about life. Okay, you have to have math skill, math skills. Do you understand that? Okay, and we literally uh, in the first portion there, what we call orientation. Okay, we're going to take you through math skills that deal 
with building engines, measuring components, all that kind of stuff. And I can tell you right now, it's going to be a lot more interesting than your math in your conventional you know, school <laughs> environment. We're going right. to put this to use, but you have to have, you, you must have these math skills in your life, much less trying to be a machinist. So anyway, we, we started this thing 35 years ago and we started with block and heads and we decided then to divide them up because the reason we did that was, and even today, you, you'll, you'll see a division in most machine shops that the machinists that do the cylinder heads stay in the cylinder heads. Okay. The machinists that do blocks stay in the block. Now, if you can do both, see, that's a really good thing to do. Okay. If you have both skills, when they're behind in the head department, you can go up there and work there. Okay. If, if, if the block department's waiting on heads, then if you're a guy that can work both ways, uh, that's a really, really, you know, that's uh, another feather in your hat right there. And we can go on about this thing and get our, you know, get the engines moving out and stuff. So that's why we have them. Each course is nine months. Uh, uh, that's where most people start. Uh, you do not have to, you can take only heads and we do have some people to do that. We have some take only blocks. Okay. Uh, now, which we did not have when Brian was here, you know, back in, in the 80s and stuff, but now we have the CNC program. That's certainly a big thing everywhere. Okay. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. Okay. On this CNC deal. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I did not mention this. We are not an open enrollment school. Okay. You must pass what is called the Bennett mechanical aptitude test. It was what the, armed forces used to see who to put in the, let's call it the motor pool, the guys that had mechanical aptitude. Okay. It does function very, very well. So what I want you to understand is this, okay. You're going to take that. Okay. And if you can pass that, you know, you're, you're what we call a gearhead. Okay. You're going to be, you know, you're going to like this stuff. Most of you certainly wouldn't be applying here if you weren't, a gear hit and you take the test and we understand uh, uh, it, it's not terrible, but it's going to see if you have basic mechanical aptitude and then you go through that. But for CNC, we have to have, you know, uh, 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 a different look at your mechanic, at your math skills. So we have a second test. If you're going to go into C CNC, that is basically math. Okay. And we just don't want you to struggle in class and all that, you know, and some people will actually go work on their math skills and then come back in three months, six months or whatever. Okay. And today EFI is obviously a big thing. Some of you've never seen a carburetor. Okay. Don't forget their carburetors do make a lot of power. Okay. And they are still in a lot of forms of motorsports in the United States but we have the EFI calibration, we call it. Some people come and only take that. that. That's another eight months right there. And then what we do, which I'll tell you, uh, this, this isn't a big th deal to a lot of engine builders, but some of the, the huge companies that they don't know what you're going to be doing in a year. Uh, you talk about some of the NASCAR teams and everything. Uh, this makes a difference to them. Okay. Uh, we have an associate degree problem, uh, associate degree also. Okay. And it combines the block, the head and general ed education. That is a two year commitment, but um, you do a lot of what I call learning how to learn. Okay. Uh, uh, we have some, some engineering stuff in there, some physics, all that, but all of it is toward the automotive, you know, engine industry, if you want to look at it that way. Um, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, I definitely need to come back to school and, and uh, get that. So one of the fun things is you've got students all over the world and in every form of motorsports at the highest level. You've got students that went off and they knew right from the start that they were going to you know, own their own shop and they, they wanted to get this experience. Uh, you've had a lot of people, uh, military people such as myself, that were 
you know, looking to, you know, do something a little bit different. I mean, if, if you drove a tank, it's not easy to drive a tank in the real world out here. Uh, so, you know, you had a lot of people come in and, and uh, you know, get, you know, just re-education from that. So it's really good. And one of the other cool things that you did was there's people like me that are parts developers. So I wanted to be in the aftermarket. Uh, I wanted to develop parts. And for 15 years, I did that actually at Wisco Piston Company. And I developed product lines out there and had a good time before uh, joining the team at Summit. But right between that time, uh, between Wisco and, uh, and Summit, was an assignment that I had overseas to create the uh, basically their first race engine building machine shop over there. And it wasn't the idea of building engines in China and shipping them here. The idea was to uh, introduce our brands at that time into the Chinese market. Because when I did this back in 2010, 2011, they had a lot of money, but they didn't have a lot of skills on how to build an engine, how to build a race car, how to race a race car. Uh, so. You know, we, we built that factory over there and we introduced the, the Weisco brand, K1, JE, uh, Ferreira valves, uh, you know, uh, camshafts. I mean, we brought all sorts of parts over there and launched this en engine building shop. But it had been 15 years since I'd run a machine and I called you up and I said, hey, uh, I need a refresher for course. Can I can I come down to the school and get on the machines again and become fluent again with this thing? And, and you remember that? Oh, yes, absolutely. absolutely. So it, it, it was, go ahead. Yeah, well, we did, we, we've had a number of graduates do that, you know, uh, come back for this or that or whatever. And uh, we work with all of them. You know, obviously, you know that. And, and we are I mean, we're real hands on on real race cars. You know what I'm saying? Uh, some of them we own, some of them we build engines for. The, the big difference between us and a lot of other people, you'll see, you know, a name on the side of the car or something, and some of them are educational, you know, schools, whatever. Okay. There's a difference between 99% of those and us. Okay. If our name is on that car, we built that engine. And if it's our car, we built the car also, you know, but we don't sponsor cars, I guess is what I'm trying to say. We build right. engines for cars and then they put our name as the engine builder on the car. Right. So, and that's kind of a, a cool thing because I hadn't worked on a lot of, you know, I'd worked on a lot of street cars at that point, but I hadn't really, you know, I, I didn't understand a drag racing program, what it takes to prepare. And the fact that, you know, 95% of winning is actually done prior to even showing up at the track. So at that point, uh, you guys had your, uh, your it was after me, but you got the orange car. You also had Pat Topolinski there uh, driving the, uh, uh, what was that thing? The red car. The Malibu and right. Mustang, yeah. Right. You guys campaigned those things. Can you, and, and now you guys are, you know, you brought some of your Copo cars out. Obviously, the uh, the orange car is uh, amazing. Can you tell us a little bit? I mean, going back to even when I was there. Um, well, first, I'll say this. So, Northwest Engines already had this, you know, bunch of customers over there. And at that time, you know, Wade was over there doing circle track. You had uh, an offshore marine program at that time that I was really happy to participate in. It was two uh, 502 cubic inch naturally aspirated engines for, you know. Brian, let me interrupt you. I remember this and I don't remember things real well. OK, but do you remember you personally I remember you putting the pistons in that 700 inch Donovan. Yes. Offshore pipe. And you were putting the pistons in and they just, the stroke was so long, the deck of the block, you know, it was around 11 inches. Okay. Right. And Brian put his piston in and he's looking to see if he missed the crank. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. So uh, the 502 there, you were the first guy to run uh, big chief cylinder heads from Dart on a range. And prior to that time, those are all conventional cylinder head uh, engines out there. And you're like, you know, you called up Dart and he said, is anybody doing this? And they said, nope, you're going to be the first, you know, because you were wondering about valve train geometry. Is a valve train going to live for, you know, an hour and a half at 7,000 wow. RPM? So, you know, you were the first guy to do that. Uh, I was actually working on trying to get push rod clearance. And I remember, you know, I, it felt like I was about ready to break through into the intake port. And I go to you and I'm like, hey, Judd, I think I'm getting a little bit close here. And then he said, go back at it. You know, we need clearance. 
And so I went back and took a little bit more and I was just absolutely sure I was going to break into the port. Went back to you, said, keep going. And then finally, the third time you're like, Brian, if you break through, you break through and we're going to have to deal with it. But one way or another, we need push rod clearance. And so uh, Greg Good was working with us at the time and he's like, okay, we are going to set this thing up on the mill and we're going to do this. We're going to be completely accurate, gauge everything out. So that was one of those life lessons that I've taught to a lot of people. Sometimes you just have to do it. Um, you know, you just have to, whatever happens, happens. But that was a thing. Uh, I remember being out at the uh, uh, track with Wade and it was a kind of a dirty, it, it was an open engine, dry sump engine and uh, did fine at the track, but he comes in off the track and a little piece of gravel got caught up in the dry sump belt, tossed the dry sump belt. Oh, and I remember looking at that oil pressure gauge of Wade's and I'm like, shut it off, shut it off. It's burning up the bearings and, you know, it, bringing the engine back into the school. So you had all these, you know, people that needed good race engines. So, you know, you supplied us students with a really wide variety of engines. And that was amazing because we also had uh, student built engines at the time. And we had people from all over the country and you'd have Oldsmobile people and Chevy people and Ford people. And we had an engine across the dyno every week that was really unique. Um, and really for me, especially working at Wiseco, getting that experience with the different forms of engines out there, the Buicks and whatever, it really taught me a lot about like, you know, what is the same amongst all engines and then what are some of the different things about all engines, deck height, rod, stroke, you know, combustion chambers, different castings. Uh, and so really that was a critical part of my learning when I ended up over at Wiseco so I could, you know, make a piston uh, that, you know, really worked as it was supposed to and something that was really engine builder friendly. That's that's another thing I want to talk about is these parts that we do at Summit Racing now. Uh, the Pro LS line in particular is, is something that I and my team work on. So we designed these pistons and rods and cranks and cams to be really engine builder friendly. And what that means is, you know, like Judd was talking about earlier, you've got to, you know, if you're a production shop, you're trying to get the engine through with the least amount of work, uh, necessary. You don't want to piss and they have to spend, you know, basically, you know, an hour on each one trying to prep it and deburr it. So there's all sorts of things that we do on these, you know, parts of ours that really take a lot of the effort out of it, you know, for the, the guy that's actually having to machine and build the engine. Because that's another thing is a lot of customers and racers out there have no idea how many times an engine might need to be mocked up and massaged and everything, you know, that Judd taught us. Uh, in terms of, you know, what it takes to get an engine built. And so if we can take three days of engine building and turn it into one day, you're basically taking the cost of that engine down by, you know, two thirds and, you know, the, the, the customer is getting something better than they would have had otherwise. And it makes you, Judd, you know, happier that you don't have to mess with this. And, you know, when it comes to pistons, this was even before the days of, you know, laser scanning and, and uh, you know, 3D you know, milling on the parts we were using a CMM at that point to kind of map things out. And uh, that was one of the other cool things is your cylinder head program was coming online uh, just as I'd come back to, uh, you know, take that refresher class there for a couple of weeks. So I got to see your your instructors and your students, you know, using the ferro arm and, and, you know, basically scanning the entire, the inside of the cylinder head. And can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like now compared to what it did back in 1996 when I was, you know, doing my thing there. Yeah, the the CNC department's really a neat deal. And it's not just the CNC, but also that what we, we use the term digitizing, okay? We do use ferro arm, um, and that's certainly in the course, you know. Um, the, it, it, you can, I mean, it just, in the old days, I mean, the measurements and all that was just by hand and slow and it's certainly nowhere near the accuracy. OK, uh, but you take the ferro arm today, which certainly is part of the course. And we scan these things, you know, they uh, it, it's really neat. I watch them down there and uh, there will be some of them in the classroom upstairs and they're downstairs in the lab, the CNC lab. OK, and uh, they're digitizing this thing and it transfers everything upstairs and they're up there doing figures up there. Uh, it, it makes um, uh, people. Let me make sure we're on the same page here. 
you know, people say, well, CNC heads are better. Okay. CNC heads are not better. Okay. For the reason you think, okay. You could do the same thing with a die grinder if you were an artist, you know, but now we can replicate. Okay. We can really, really get these things accurate. Every one of them the same and repeat them. That is a huge thing about CNC. So what we do is we still work the cylinder heads. Okay. By hand, we, they go from the porting room to the flow bench room, you know, making changes. Short side radiuses are one of the big things. And then the CSA cross sectional area, they go on with all this, but the big thing when they get it where they like it, the flow numbers look good. There's much more to the head than flow numbers, but you're certainly going to look at the flow numbers. Okay. Um, we do all this stuff. They're looking at the ratio of the valve, you know, to the discharge area. Well, with the, with the ferro arm, we can absolutely, okay. We can absolutely, you know, to tenths of a thousandths be accurate on this thing. And then we put that into this, that information into the CNC machine and it makes the cuts. Okay. That, that is the big deal that's going on today. It isn't the CNC. If you, if you digitize a bad design port and then CNC it, although it's CNC, it still is a bad port. A lot of people don't understand that until they get here. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. So you can attest that about half of every cylinder head that I personally have reported, I went right through into the intake port. <laughs> you know, I, I never developed, I loved the cylinder head uh, class because I'd be in there on the flow bench and you know, you would actually have all the, you'd have cores outside, you know, that, you know, you'd have brought in, you know, cylinder heads. So, you know, the students were actually going out there. And what I began to understand, a lot of the, um, the cost of the school is actually replacing the tools that I would wad up. You know, every once in a while, a kid would lock up the boring bar in a block, and that was always ugly. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you know, of course, I put, you know, holes in cylinder heads. And it was a question of whether we just try to braise it or just start all over again. But, you know, going through there and, and testing different valve jobs, uh, the bull hog, you know, all that stuff, you know, I could just go in there and spend hours, you know, doing this stuff. And I'd take my readings down, what little change made what. Um, that was excellent. And, and that's something that you don't get at any other school is that hands-on, uh, you know, experience of just being let loose with all this very big, expensive equipment. And, uh, I tell people all the time, you know, it's like you, you learn through failure a lot. And I definitely had my, my fair share of failures down there. But, you know, I learned lessons from those that, you know, I was able to fix, you know, uh, myself. Uh, I was able to pass that uh, knowledge on to a lot of uh, uh, other students uh, and basically other people in life. And I'm doing the same thing right now uh, with uh, Mike Schmidt, who I work with. Um, in the, the Summit brand department there. And so we're building a 408 cubic inch engine right now. And it's probably 35 different segments of here's your block. You know, here's how you wash the block. You know, here's how we you start measuring the main bores and the housing bores and all this stuff. This is all stuff that I learned from you and the instructors there at the school. And we've turned these into nice little three minute bite-sized videos for people that they can find on YouTube. You know, we can post them to uh, the on all cylinders blog. So if somebody wants to read about, you know, how to install pistons on a rod and how to do spiral locks and stuff, uh, spiral locks still the bane of my existence. You know, I don't do them often enough to stay, you know, fluent in it, but you just, you know, you have to get back into it and three or four of them in, you know, you kind of get your groove back. But so we're, we're creating all this content that's going to be on the on all cylinders blog. And also like when you're buying a pro LS camshaft, uh, you, you could call up, any of our the multitudes of sales and tech people there at Summit Racing. Uh, but a lot of it is, is you're probably still in the decision phase of, you know, do I want this? Do I want that? You know, how does this really apply to my vehicle? You know, how am I limiting myself? Or maybe I had to rethink that cam choice. Uh, so that's cool that we can put all that stuff out there in these little mini catalogs and just, you know, put them right there on the parts page so that the, the customer themselves can actually go through there and, and get an idea of what they want. So that way, when they call the sales and tech people, it makes it really easy to hone in uh, on, you know, basically what we're doing. And on the subject of cams, which is one of my favorite 
subjects in the entire world. I can talk cans. I think many of us can for weeks and for the rest of our lives, but you were the guy that taught me a lot about cams. And can you just, can you get started with when you were young coming up and maybe we ought to go all the way back to when you were in college and the fact that hardly anybody uh, in the city of Houston, except for Carol Cottle, as I remember, could degree a cam. Do you want to tell us about the history of that and how you kind of got into really even Northwest engines? Yeah, it in um, the year was roughly 1968, 69. And uh, uh, we had some really fast, you know, national, nationally competitive drag cars here. And I was just watching everything that was going on. And um, the, I was born and raised here. And, you know, there's a lot of arguments, but the, there'll be arguments about this. But there were two people that I believe could accurately degree a cam in the city, a city the size of Houston in 68. Uh, Richard Warwick and Richard Stelter both have passed away. But um, uh, I, I, I realized that and I went to Richard's shop, Richard uh, Stelter's shop, and I said, hey, uh, I was going to U of H and you know, I'm working in the evening or whatever. And he worked, he did a bunch of muscle cars, you know, all kind of stuff. I just said, hey, you know, I'd like to be around you. And the main thing is, I know you degree these cams, and I'm thinking this, these valve events have got to be important. And um, it wasn't being done. People were just lining up dots, and that was about the end of it. Anyway, so I so I learned to degree cams there, and started understanding, you know, this duration and uh, things that I didn't even know really exist. And you know, the first thing when you have two young guys, even here when I you know, in orientation, uh, uh, they'll be talking about, well, their friend got a cam and it's, you know, it's 540 lift, it's 600 lift, it's 570. You know, the the lift of the cam is the last thing you need to worry about. Okay. It's certainly important, but you have got to get the valve events. Now, this is where it gets a little shaky. Okay. There are a number of people out there, the new big thing, is we're not going to talk duration, load separation, and intake center line. We are going to talk valve events. And you must, in other words, IO, IC, EO, EC, intake opening, intake closing, exhaust opening, exhaust closing. There's no doubt that's what the engine sees. Okay. But there seems to be a movement right now. Okay. That that's the way we're going to discuss cams instead of duration lobe separation and intake center line. I don't agree with it. Okay. If you're, if you're working on one particular engine, I know the NHRA pro stock guys, which are just incredible, you know, engine builders, they do valve events, but they're working on one engine. When we're talking with someone less than Jason line, for instance, right? Okay. <laughs> You know, something like that. OK, right. we need I, I see it in my school. We need to look at let's get a duration intake and exhaust. Let's look at a lobe separation and where are we going to put this in the engine? Now, when we do that, do we end up with given valve events? Yes. But I still think I don't think the world's ready yet to just go to valve events, except at the very highest levels. When I finish, let's go engine masters, for instance, right? We may put seven cams in the engine. And when we're doing all these changes, advanced retardant, changing cams, duration, split between the intake and exhaust duration, whatever we're doing, does it produce four valve events? And do I certainly look at those and see as we're making all these changes, looking for tendencies. But I still think that we need a lobe separation, a duration, and, and of course lift, we have to have lift. I mean, obviously that is, but lift's just kind of like the salt and pepper on top of the chicken fried steak. More lift until you start tearing up the valve train at the RPM you're turning is generally better. Right, so part of the group out there leading the charge on this valve events thing is, if, People that know me know that I'm really into LS, and we want to talk about one engine 
that you can really get to know very, very well, uh, that would be a case for valve events. So when we created the the line of Pro LS cams, you know, I grew up with, you know, what you taught me with the lobe separation and, and uh, advance and all that stuff. And then it, it became because these intake manifolds were so locked in, you know, that long runner piece, people started to understand like, and, and you know, you taught us all this stuff with, uh, I'll use the word one eye open is better than none, which is a little bit about what you're talking there is, you know, you have this idea of all these numbers and you put it in the engine, but you want to change it a little bit. You want a little bit more top end. So you basically start moving out the intake closing point. You know, you want to build more low end torque for a truck cam, for instance. So you start pulling that back into the, you know, the 33 or 38 uh, closing point. And the Pro LS cams are actually designed that way and they're designed in increments. And if you want to, this would be kind of a fun lesson because I, I can kind of tell people what I think about it, but there are four valve events. And Jed, do you want us? You want to tell us the most important one, and then you want to go back into the other three events. And uh, this is a fun argument for a lot of people. But you, want to, you want to talk to us a little bit? Sure, for hours. Um, I don't know. I I was I grew up convinced, okay, that the intake closing point was the most important. Okay, I still lead toward that today. I even look when we're on the dyno and we're changing a lot of these cams, you know, um, I see tendencies that when we add duration or whatever, well, the intake closing point tends after you've got the engine and, you know, making good power, the intake, the intake closing point tends to want to be right in the same area more so than the other three points. Um, I'm not sure on a blown engine, um, uh, that the intake closing point is the most important. I, I, I vacillated through the years. There was a time when I believed the intake closing point was more important than the other three. Now, for those somebody about to faint or something, uh, of the other three put together, I'm sorry. I know that's not true today, but I, I right now this year, um, I'm back on the intake closing point is the most important. Um, we could make a case for all four points. There's no question about it. That exhaust opening point, I never thought I would think, you know, because I'm such an intake person. Um, uh, but th that exhaust opening point uh i can tell you that blow down on that cylinder it can make a lot so i don't know but if i had to pick a number personally i'm going to stick with the intake closing all right so that's kind of how we we describe it as well so like on the animal cylinders blog any of the videos that we've done uh when we're trying to help a customer understand you know what they're doing uh with the help of cam motion actually we they actually license us their cam calculator it's a really cool cal calculator you'll find it in the calculators section on the summit website but what it does is say you've got an oldsmobile 455 right you know something that's a little out there has its own preferences and you know that there's a very very good cam out there with the following durations and lobe separation in advance and so you can actually take those specs and load them into the top of this calculator and down at the bottom uh it'll give you basically the four individual events where they're degreed and you can see what happens when i advance a cam you know plus you four, right and, and so well everybody just advances a cam to gain low end torque right well that's because the intake closing point is earlier you know or you're retarded to make more top end well you get to see what those individual events are now the problem is is that if you are just merely uh advancing and retarding the cam you're actually making one or maybe two events correct but then you're making the two other events incorrect. And so what you're doing, Jed, there, when you're doing your development, you know, like you said, you're you know, putting seven cams through this. You're making decisions on, okay, we knew we'd get this one and this one very, very close. What happens if I open the exhaust three degrees earlier? Well, what happens if I, you know, intake opening, you know, I go from five to 10 degrees before. What it starts doing in this calculator, it, it starts spitting out really wonky looking numbers. 
you know, back when I was going to school, uh, every comp cam was 110 degrees of lobe separation. Every ISKI cam was 106. Every Ultradyne uh, out there was 104. Yeah. It's like, I think about it now and it can't be right. You know, but that's how the world was back then. But that's why you had to get custom cams back then because, you know, the, the very good people at those cam companies really knew more than, you know, what was specifically on the shelf. Uh, so they, they could help you tune in your cam, you know, so you were working with Steve Lowe at LSM at that point, uh, some of the great guys over at Comp. Uh, you're working with, uh, uh, what was the fella, Dima Elgin, uh, not of Elgin cams, he's a separate guy. He did some really cool four valve stuff. So he had a different understanding of, of cams than basically any of us in V8 world. But, you know, we've got that cal calculator on the website. Uh, it's helped us create, you know, basically things in increments. So we've got intake closing, basically trying to help us with our power band. We've got intake opening. These days, a lot of it is people just want the lumpy sound. So you keep opening that intake earlier and you're actually using the exhaust pulse to actually blow back through the intake uh, port there, which is giving you that choppy idle. It's the function of overlap that's happening. My next favorite is uh, exhaust opening. Like you said, you know, on a truck cam, we may close that intake valve at 35 degrees before bottom dead center. And that's to use every ounce of positive pressure on top of that piston to keep pushing on that crank until the very last minute. But the downside of that is your valve is still basically closed when the piston is on the, on the upstroke. And that's actually creating uh, back pressure, if you want to call it that, uh, on the top of the piston. That's called blowdown. So that's why on a, on a you know, heavy duty streetcar, you might see uh, exhaust opening points in the, the 60 or 65 degree area, but all of our cams have been developed this way. And so it just gives you more of an idea, like the correct way to go. Uh, and if you want to change the behavior of your engine, it gives you a place to start looking at it. But uh, so you're, you're good at a lot of other things too. Uh, and like you say, you know, when you're building a large cubic inch or you, you want to tell us about your C5R headed uh, go back to 1999 when you purchased the orange Camaro up right back behind the hugger orange Camaro right behind you and you brought it, you got it straight to the drag strip. And I think you clicked off like a 1360 or something like the very first time. That is true. Right. And so it was 13s to 12s to 11s to 10s to 9s and the bottom of the 8s. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? And, and you, you still play with that car. The, the, um, that's what we did. Um, uh, everyone was learning on LSs then, you know, and, um, we got in with the magazine people, you know, we went to an NMCA race or whatever, and we started this and that, and there, you know, they did some stories on it, but, um, we, we have, uh, we just have a lot of fun with everything we do here at the school. You know, we, we, um, what we did uh, using the computer really helped us, you know, now that we could look at, you know, uh, the, one of the big things back then was manifold pressure uh, to see. And um, it was an SS Camaro. Uh, you sure can't tell by that hood, but it was an original SS car. <clears throat> and we got to the point that uh, uh, we were pulling manifold vacuum, you know, by about, Oh, I don't know. I can't remember the numbers, but I'm going to tell you 62, 6300, you know, and so we're trying to find out what's wrong. You know, the manifold, the throttle body, you know, the air filter itself, the air, the air intake. And um, it turned out the worst thing at the time was that we were still using the original scoop. OK, uh, we literally took the scoop off, put a head on the flow bench. We put the air intake, all that, the filter. And then we mounted the hood, okay, and put all and this and we took up the whole flow bench room, okay. And we just started seeing what we actually ported the hood. That sounds insane, but we had a fiberglass guy and we ported the hood scoop, okay. And we finally we 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 helped it some there, and then we got to the point that you know we were turning too many RPM, we'd gotten over seven thousand, you know, and uh, we had to start taking the air in from the, you know, the front, the, the grill area, and we made a box, you know, and uh, we just worked that thing all the way. We just kept 
you know, uh, we were one of the, the first by far that ever sleeved an aluminum LS1 block. We got it out to a four inch bore. I know that sounds small today, but that was a big deal. I think we got it to 460 or something with sleeves. Uh, we, we, we literally, us and the students, uh, Pat was the big guy behind all that when he was with us. Uh, uh, and we got the thing out to 360, 70 inches or whatever, which that sounds small now, but you know, quite a bit back then. And we just kept going on, you know, more compression and all of a sudden, you know, where, uh, well, the rear end didn't last anything. I can tell you that. And we had to go to a 12 volt, but the whole school did that. Uh, it was just an incredible deal that went on, you know, for a decade, you know, for sure. We hadn't worked on it in a while now, sitting in the trailer. Uh, I, 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 uh, we still, you know, a lot of the students are here, heard stories about it and everything. And uh, it was a very fast LS, so one of the most published cars from 2000 to 2010. I know that sounds like, you know, dinosaur days now, but it was, it was in all the magazines. Uh, we won a lot of races with it. And um, the C5R heads uh, obviously were never put on a, uh, they were never put on a vehicle or anything, but they were used in the C5R Lamaze program, you know, all their road race stuff. Incredible, incredible head. It was way ahead of its time. Uh, today we're in, you know, the DR heads are what most people are using. Uh, only because the casting can, the runner can be raised more without welding um, that DR head is still one of the meanest things that we've ever put on an engine, you know, inline valve wedge head. But uh, we just went through that, kept going faster and faster. And uh, we got the car into the 80s. Um, uh, we went the fastest the car ever went, uh, 10 and a half inch tires. It was a stick car. Uh, we went an 801 about three times, never ran a seven. It just said, I won't. Uh, but we ran um, a number of 801s at about, um, let's see, we ran about, uh, oh, wow, I can't remember the mile an hour. That's terrible. Uh, uh, do you know, uh, let's see, I'm going to say um, 176, 178. I'd have to look and see. Wow. But, uh, and that was, uh, we were having to carry I don't want to sound like I'm whining or something, but we, we were quite fast and they, they decided it was the transmission and I, they put a hundred pounds on me, then 150 pounds and ended up, I was having to carry 200 pounds for the transmission, which today you run into the automatic at the same weight. Yeah. In other words, we, it was just a test bed, you know, now yeah. we with the copos. Yeah. yeah. It, it's it's kind of funny. So you were back then. You were a very big NA person, and not so much into blower and turbo. And we'll get into yeah. that. <laughs> I'm still that way. I'm still that way. But um, I realized uh, this, this. I don't want to get everybody mad, but we do have fast blower cars today. Okay. I look back in the 2000s, and yes, the blower cars were faster than naturally aspirated. But what they did, they put some blower on it. You know, and all, I'm okay with this, you know, and it'd build a bunch of torque and mid range and they'd shift it, you know, at a low RPM. That doesn't work today, folks. I can tell you right now, they are race cars. Those pro mods, uh, you know, the outlaw street cars, and of course the factory shootout cars, the Copos, Mustangs, and, and the drag packs. I mean, 10,000 is nothing. Right. I mean, that is nothing. And we, we have, Pro mods going through the lights over 10,000 RPM. I'm hearing 11,000. So today you can't just put the blower on and then not have to turn an RPM. These right. are race engines today. They, they, you have to have the blower and turn the RPM. So I'm much more into them today. Right. Uh, taking you back a little bit with the orange car. So I remember, I remember the engine when it was still i think it was still 346 cubic inches and he'd hit like an unheard of 756 horsepower with cathedral ports and the intake manifold and i remember you cutting and shortening the runners on that factory ls6 intake and all that business before you made the switch to c5r but you were always a big rpm guy um it took you 
years to finally go uh, 427, 421, two, or 8, 9, up until 433. And then I think after you hit 433, I don't know if you ever went any bigger with that, but you just kept on turning more and more RPM. And I remember us being around one of the Chevrolet performance guys and you're telling him, I'm going through the back door at 10,100. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what lift you have on that cam. I think it's one one hundred or better now. At this one hundred twenty, I think, is what it was. Inch twenty. <laughs> right. So, yeah. you know, that was when I was in school. You know, eight eighty was a big number, and then I always hear with pro stockers were nine nine fifty, and then it was an inch. And I'm trying to visualize this engine at ten thousand five hundred RPM or whatever it was. You know, opening the valve up an inch, and I remember you were going through very high quality PSI valve springs every seven runs or so you'd have to replace those things and you were telling me how much a set of top level PSI springs cost and I'm just like oh man but that's what it takes to win you know it's it's a it's a it's a fun effort uh, that the, the students got to be a part of that it's also cool because you actually shared a ton of articles uh, you, you said something at that point that was really kind of interesting is like People will help you out until you're about 95% as fast as them, and then they cut you off. And from there, you got to clod out. They're not going to share any more information with you. But, you know, you've shared the recipes uh, to these engine builds that you've done, like the Copo car, the first one that was a naturally aspirated LS7, and I think it was 830-odd horsepower you were able to get out of it uh, at that point. And you just said, here's the cams, here's the pistons, here's the compression, whatever it was. And you said, I, I can hand this information over to anybody. It doesn't mean that they're going to be able to do with it what I can do with it. You, know, you can give them the recipe, but there's lots of little things in there that you know you kept going. You never stopped at that number, and they're never going to be able to progress past that number. They don't have you know what the school the school teaches you about just keep on going, keep on going. And you know you talk about working on circle track engines over a winter you know, from the last race of the season. And you might not pick any horsepower up, but you would spread the RPM uh, band that you would make that power. And that would make the guy faster at the track. And it was just, you also had another quote from Engine Masters. We, we should talk about Engine Masters here in a bit, but you had a funny quote there. Your people were asking me your, your secret to your <laughs> success on, you know, what it took to have these you know, winning engines that you guys build at the school. And you're like, well, honestly, usually it's just the guy that's standing on the largest pile of parts at the end of the uh, development season that, that's going to be the winner. So how many cams do you have thrown out on the floor, you know, that people would die for, you know, how many pistons, how many this and that uh, cylinder heads, how many, you know, cylinder heads that you guys had to go through to find horsepower. Uh, and sometimes you go backwards, sometimes you go forward, but the engine never remains the same. I got to learn a little bit about that when I was doing uh, pistons for pro stock customers. We had seven pro stock customers at the time and no piston was ever the same in the next engine as it was in the last engine. It was just constant development and it made it, it was tough, man. I mean, as tough as it was for me to do a piston, you know, for my company, you know, they were doing the same thing with rods and cams and push rods and, you know, the race to bigger, thicker push rods and cylinder heads. So it's, uh, it never stops. Uh, I always thought that there might be a time where like, what can I do any further to go any faster? But there's always something that happens that you uncover. I mean, it, it, it just never stops, but do you want to talk about that a little bit in that concept? Yeah. I, I, and I wanted to say, I just said, here, I want to tell you another thing. Okay. Another thing that I say, Okay, and I don't know how to politely say this, but in your group of friends, you need to be the least educated, the most novice. You learn from being around people above you. See, the male ego, you want to be that alpha male and, you know, you got the best car and all that. How can you learn from people that are slower than you? So you got to and you have to earn that right to be around those people. Don't get me wrong but you're going to learn a lot more from somebody that's running faster than you, than you are the people that are slower. And, and uh, for instance, uh, we actually got that engine to go through the lights at 10,200. I'd love to take credit for that, but that was Dan Jessel. Okay. 
he just thought it was, he thought the school was cool, you know, and he's got one of his right hand men, one right hand men up there as a graduate, you know, and all that. He thought the school was a really cool idea. We met at the ATEC, one of the ATEC conventions. Um, but anyway, uh, he said, let me just look at this whole thing. And uh, certainly this man is, you know, just an incredible, incredibly intelligent guy. Uh, and we sent him, you know, the casting, the valve, we sent him everything we were using. And he called back and says, we need the valves to be 100 longer, this and that. We're going to change the pivot length of the rocker, which people, you know, people outside the really hardcore racers have never even thought about the pivot length of the rocker. And we went from about 98, 97, 98 to 10, 2. Okay. That was good. But we also, the spring life, okay, was 50% greater than before. Okay. Uh, so we were turning more RPM with the same springs. But when the geometry got stable, of course, the push rods were half inch and 916 diameter push rods. You cannot worry about the weight of the push rods up there. It's just, it must be solid. Okay. So the big thing is you need to look at people that are doing better than you in, in your sport. Okay. They're not going to tell you everything. Don't get me wrong, but uh, there's a lot to be learned out there from just observation. Okay. Um, I, I don't know how to tell it. I'm not going to tell this complete story, but we had decided to build a race car and I wanted to see what was going on in that form of racing. And so Linda and I got on the plane and went to their world finals. Some of you listening will figure this out. And uh, uh, Pat called me and says, Hey, how's it looking down there? Okay. And I said, uh, I said, I should say over there. I said, Pat, this isn't going to be easy. This was a very competitive, you know, form of drag racing. I said, but, these guys are not looking at their valve train, except for Billy Glidden. His engines, he's looking at the valve train. The rest of these guys aren't even pulling the valve cover. And see, what did that tell me? They weren't pushing the limits of the RPM of the engine. Because then you have to look at the springs after every pass. We're checking seat pressure after every pass, We're running leak downs. And Billy Glidden was the only one there doing that. And I said, I said, we got a bunch of fast cars that I think we can run with. And I'm going to brag for a second. We built the car, dynoed all winter. And then we went to the first national event and uh, we qualified number three out of about, oh, I'll say 20 cars at our first race. And so what happened when we did that? Then the school was somebody to those racers. Okay. And you go, and I could go, well, this helps us, you know, get other students. And that's why we have all these cars. So people will see it and we, more people come to school, but let me tell you what it does for the students. Okay. What happens is that these hardcore race shops, uh, engine masters included, of course, if they can build an engine, okay to run there that can win and they build these cars and we did set the record in that class <clears throat> they must know something so i'll give them a try on getting graduates from them that right. was a big deal that was a big deal about engine masters we didn't get a bunch of uh, extra students from it certainly we got some but you know a lot of engine builders follow that thing that's a big big deal or was a big big deal i don't know if it'll ever be back but uh, uh, that was, you know, we had more people looking for our graduates. Yeah. So you bring up and, and we talked about the wide variety of engines. And, you know, I found this when I was uh, well, really this entire time I've worked in the industry is there are circle track people and there are drag race people. And then there are road race people. There are autocross people. And there's not a lot of people that speak all of those languages at the same time. But that was one really cool thing about the school is you had customers and, you know, all the way across the board there uh, that, you know, I and many others got experience with different forms of racing that I never had. I'm not going to say I didn't have an appreciation for it, uh, appreciation, but I didn't know, you know, at the higher levels, you know, uh, I remember uh, 
two uh, cup engines that came through back in the 18 degree days when they were making 740 horsepower out of 350 whatever cubic inches. And I was just like, whoa. And I got to come in and, uh, uh, you know, tune on those things. That was one of the cool things about you and the, uh, you know, I talk about, you know, me breaking tools and cutters and all that stuff. You let me roam out there on the dyno and make pulls, uh, go out there and do my jetting, go out there and do my uh, uh, ignition timing. And it wasn't just one type of engine, it was, you know, across the board. So that was, that was really helpful. Uh, that engine masters thing, when you get into this concept, we talked earlier about valve events, you know, and how important I think that they are, but I know them really well for one particular engine. But the cool thing about engine masters is that was a whole new engine almost every year in terms of it's going to be this compression and, you know, uh, the smarter guys can go out there and be like, wow, with the rule set that they've got this year, uh, this other different kind of engine is going to be popular. And you've done, you know, Cleveland stuff. Uh, you've done LS1 stuff. I mean, can you tell us a little bit, oh, real quick before you do. So that gets back into your world of cam durations and lobe separations in advance. You know, so you kind of know what's what works there. And then, you know, that's something that I could not tell you the best valve events for a Cleveland with this intake manifold, CID heads or whatever, but you know what that is because you competed with this wide variety, but you want to talk about, you know, taking the students up there to the, to those uh, shootouts there. Yes. Um, they're really, really awesome. Uh, there was no doubt about it. Um, um, let me, let me, let me go back just a little bit. One thing we're talking about the different forms of racing. What I, what I do with the students here. Okay. Is understand we're trying to, what you have to understand is that what happens in most of the cases, depending on the duration, even the rules, okay? What, what you're going to see is that you're going to have an RPM range, one that your engine, cylinder heads, weight, whatever, however you want to look at it, okay? You're going to have an RPM range that there's going to be a maximum. And then the type of racing you're going to do is going to set a minimum, okay? And that's what you have to really understand, you know, on the cam on everything, runner volume, intake manifolds, you know, the whole package has to go together. Okay. But that's what you see when we talk about different types of racing, you can always look at that range. And I'm going to say something here. It's controversial. Okay. For years and years, my feeling was, the thing you had to look at the most was power after peak. Okay. In other words, you can make the power, but it had to hold it after peak. It wouldn't, we didn't want it to what we would call waterfall. It makes peak power at 7,800 and 82 it's down 40, 50 horsepower. Okay. Now there are some rule sets. Okay. That are out there that that'll have to happen. Okay. It can even be valve spring pressure in some cases. But power after peak, you see, if you think about it, even though the motor makes, say, 800, but if it can hold 780, 770, you know, for 500, 600 RPM, think what happens. Your minimum RPM that you're going to run at is now higher. Okay? That's kind of how simple it really is. So what I wanted to say is this. Uh, everyone wants to look at the peak number and it's like a flow number that's a good number a head that flows more air can be better but we have what we you know there's some heads out there that are they are intentionally they're what we call flow bench heads and you you ground them and made the runner the csa too large and you know you ripped the short side out of it and now it prints these numbers and it's not going to go down the track or on the dyno but that being said Horsepower numbers are good. Everybody looks at them. They, they certainly sell the engines. That's for sure. Okay. So what, what I want you to understand is this. Okay. You need to always look at the minimum RPM that that engine is going to have to pull from. The orange car, for instance, with a five-speed manual transmission. Okay. It still had a minimum RPM. On that car there, it was about 82, 8,300, depending on what the air was that day. Okay. That, that point right there, do not ever think 
that you can give up 10 or 12 there to pick up five or six at peak. It will not work in anything that I've done. That is a big overlooked point. When I would go to fifth gear, we'd make a change and I could go to, and when I went to fifth gear, which that was one to one, you know, with the ring and pinion, it was a 514, 538, depending on what the air was that day. But uh, when I did that, I could basically tell right then, okay, if this chain was going to work. I mean, that tack had to start right back up. If it didn't, I'm telling you, the car never got accelerating the rest of the way through the quarter. Just that, an interesting point. Yeah. So that, that's one of the things you talk about RPM. And uh, it, it, was pretty, it was kind of funny about Wade, you know, thinking about, you know, RPM and, and stuff. And, you know, we always find that racers are always pulling, you know, way more RPM than what, you know, the engine dyna would suggest is correct. And I never quite got to understand, you know, why that is. I'm telling you, know, take some gear out of it, you know, so you're loading the engine down lower. But they were faster with the R RPM. And I, I finally got to understand it, you know, with my own Corvette that I've got is, you know, t uh, total engine airflow did a really nice port on my LS6 heads and my O2 uh, C5Z. Uh, gave me a lot of airflow. The most important thing, and Mike Schmidt actually helped me out with this, is he told me, you need to put a cut down LS3 valve in it that weighs 77 grams. Yeah. Like, okay, you know, do that. So that's what we did. And uh, it was making 450, 400, uh, you know, at the wheels. Uh, but the fun thing was, is, you know, we, we uh, Eric Johnson over at Backstreet uh, Performance, good friend, he set the wave limiter to 7,000. I'm like, I need more. I need more. 71, 72, 73, 74, 75. And the whole, the whole thing that I, I hadn't really ever considered in road racing or doing a track day or something like that is I needed to be able to hang out mid corner at 110 miles an hour at basically 6,000 RPM, come out of that corner kind of sideways, get the car straightened out at 7,000 so I could bang the next gear. Yeah. So it, it just allowed me to be just that much closer to the next gear, uh, you know, going down the next straightaway. So that, that's something that, uh, you know, you, you get to learn down there at the, at the school, uh, you know, from being with racers. Something else that I don't know how much you can talk about this, uh, but when people see how fast you guys are going, uh, you get a lot of high level uh, racers out there that come to you uh, for cylinder head ports, you know, for this, for engines and that, and you actually will develop uh, parts for these folks, you know, uh, to a big company, uh, you guys are willing to spend the time, you know, on somebody's program. Can you talk about some of the, the customers that are buying cylinder heads from a vocational school? <laughs> Not a lot. <laughs> no, they don't talk about it much. Um, um, we, we do have a serious cylinder head department. You know, it started with Greg Good and then it was Casey. And now, now you know, we have Hooper, you know, it's Sean to me, but, uh, uh, let me tell you, uh, we just, we think we have, you know, we, we look at everything, but I just want to tell you the truth An advantage we have that, that a few people, Jerry Stahl was the first person to figure this out that admitted it. Okay. Uh, another person that helped me a lot, but, uh, he passed away, but, uh, you see, if you have a shop, you have to make a living. Okay. The, the stuff has to go out the door and you have to get a check. Well, number one is I have an army of employees. I mean, we would work in shifts. You know what I'm saying? Till three o'clock in the morning. Okay. You know, and this guy was doing, you know, and we're on the back and forth, back and forth, flow bench, dyno, you know, dyno, flow bench, you know, just on and on back and forth. That could go on till, I mean, daylight, absolutely. And so that's an advantage. We didn't have to get a check. So I'd like to take credit with how smart we are, but you know, if you can just use smart hours, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We, we would just work on these things until, you know, it made the most power on the dyno and, we did have a couple of times, I'll be perfectly honest with you, it made the most power on the dyno, but when you're messing with the intake, you know, 
volume, uh, sometimes smaller will go faster, even though it on the dyno, it shows a bigger number. Right. Uh, that's the kind of stuff we do here. You know, we have a blast and we've just had, you know, I, 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 I loosely am using this term genius, but we had some very, very bright people in there. And let me tell you what happens when you do start doing things that run fast. Okay. It gets a lot of people's attention. One of the, one of the biggest things that we ever, you know, that uh, the, the Indy race in NHRA, you know, the Indy nationals, that's their Daytona 500. They don't like me referencing it probably to a NASCAR race, but that's their biggest race of the year. Okay. And we were up there with our copo and we were torn down. We were going very, very fast. And somebody just said, Hey, we know they're a vocational school. Uh, you know, there's people out there spending a lot of money and doing this and that. We're just going to see if it was legal. And I'll be honest with you, our cylinder head guy, when he heard we were being torn down, he almost fainted because it does push every limit there is. Okay. Uh, but it passed tech at Indy. That was a big, big deal. I sweated a little bit myself. It, it's, it's funny. So you mentioned that. So the school also gets uh, a lot of attention from, you know, manufacturers in the industry and, and people like Summit Racing. You know, we love supporting you guys. You guys have written tech articles for us. Uh, we've had a lot of cool things. And so, you know, uh, you know, cam manufacturers want to put cams in the hands of your students, you know, so that when they go out there and whether they go work in somebody else's shop or they go up and open up their own shop, eventually it's someday they want to have, uh, you know, experience with that. And, you know, when I was working with Weisco there, uh, I did a lot of the same thing. I, you know, I, I wanted to make sure every one of your engines had Weisco pistons in it. And to this day, you know, we've, we've, we've had some really successful engine builders that, you know, because I knew, you know, the school and I knew the quality of the people that you have out there that I need to help these people out when they're small so that as they grow and they do, you know, that they would keep on using our parts. Um, and so that's been a really cool thing about, you know, the summit deal as well as, you know, I was talking earlier about, you know, having these parts being really uh, in engine builder friendly, but I still talk to tons of students down there. Uh, you know, I was over at uh, uh, Holly LS Fest a couple of weeks ago. And I saw that you guys were out there with uh, one of the Copo cars, uh, it, Brian Nealon over there uh, with late model uh, engines, uh, Eric at HK. Uh, over there, you know, I, I still talk with these people all the time. And if I need a little bit of help with something, I'm like, hey, what are your thoughts on this and that? Um, you know, they can help me out and, and you know, that helps us develop parts and, and having these really high quality people in race shops all across the country, uh, you know, NASCAR, Pro Stock. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what it's like maintaining those relationships with the students years, in this case, between you and me, you know, over 20? Uh, maintaining those relationships with the students uh, who you really helped give them a start. Yeah, well, the big thing we do is that at the PRI, which we're not having this year, uh, but at the PRI, we have a reunion there. And uh, because so many of our graduates are all over, well, they're all over the world, actually, but certainly the majority is in the United States. And we, we usually have... Uh, uh, 250, 300 graduates come to that and they'll bring their bosses and they'll bring their racing partners. So it gets large really quick. You know what I'm saying? But these guys, you have to understand of them. Take, take uh, uh, Brian and Pecos at LME. They didn't even know each other. They came to school here and now they have one of the largest, you know, LS building facilities in the country. Uh, and certainly uh, I would say, the majority of their employees are, are graduates here. So what, what we have now is graduates hiring graduates. And, you know, that makes my day. You know, my ego used to be my engines. Okay. Now it's my students, you know, where they're working, you know, I mean, every pro stock team, uh, they're covered with them. Uh, NASCAR, we got guys that have been, uh, uh, I, I just tell you one quick story. Uh, we were we were over in Charlotte, and uh, I was we were walking through the shop shop with Doug Yates. And we're walking through there, 
and he knew he had a lot of employees there, you know, we're walking through there and this guy goes, Hey Judd, Hey Linda, Hey Judd, Hey Linda, you know, and he just said, wait a minute, how many do I have here? So he got on, he got on the, on the intercom and said, well, everybody graduated from the school of automotive machines come to the front room. Okay. And I, I don't remember the exact number, but this was in the cup shop. I mean, nothing but the Ford cup engines were built in that building. Okay. And I think they had 47 employees there and it turned out like 18 of them were Sam graduates. Yeah. There, there's no exaggeration there. It may have been more than that, but it was a huge amount. And that, that's a big deal to me. You know, we must be doing something right uh, for these guys to do that. So, so we stay in contact all the time and, and we do have a little problem. You know, uh, I, I have to be very careful and they do also, because there are some things they can't tell us, you know what I'm saying? For the lack of a better word, but most of them's bosses. Okay. Well, you know, they know what they can't give us this cam for this or whatever like that, but they'll say, Hey, you know, these gaskets seem to work. These springs seem to work. You might want to look at this. You might want to look at that. And some of them, well, the majority of them in pro stock, they get permission before they tell me anything uh, because that's a, uh, you, well, we don't need to go into that, you know, but uh, you know, looking at plugs, fuel, we talk about all that stuff and um, it's, it's just, I, I tell you what I tell people, uh, uh, what I'm doing today, it sure beats working for a living. I get up every morning and I'm going to Disneyland. Yep. So you alluded to it a little bit when you first got your start in engine building, but uh, I remember something that was kind of interesting is you actually started off with a fair lane and you were trying to make the fair lane go fast, trying to make it go fast. And you were just like, Oh my gosh. And I think the very first time you saw a 69 Camaro Z 28 go down the track, it was already three times faster than you with like headers. You know? I, I didn't know. I didn't understand. You know, I just really didn't understand engines, but here's what I knew. I had a 406 cubic inch engine in my three, you know, 390 based fair lane with, you know, all kind of aftermarket Ford stuff and everything. And here's a 69 Z 28. And all I knew was I have over 400 inches and he has 302 and he was running three or four tenths faster than I was. And this engine had not been out of the car. Right. Uh, so that ended that. So you ended up going down and buying your own 69 Camaro. And remember you mentioning at the time, you thought it was probably the only 69 Z 28 ever made that did not have pause attraction in it because you couldn't afford it at that time. Uh, you quickly got that car and uh, can we, can we mention that you may have street raced when you were young? Yes. Um, not proud of it. And let me say this to everyone. I didn't drive fast. I didn't speed. I didn't get tickets. If I was racing on the street, it was for money. Okay. And we had what we call the ordnance depot. It was actually built during world war II in case uh, the port was bombed, they could get planes in and out in the woods on this giant concrete one mile straight away. Okay. We, I, I did not, go out on the street and floorboard. I raced for money. Linda and I, I mean, we raced six nights a week. Monday was dead, but in a city the size of Houston, you can run six nights a week. So from that, you talk about winning money. You also won your wife that way. You want to tell us that story? Yes, she certainly doesn't like it, but a lot of people have heard it. Um, I was, uh, you know, we had these drive-ins, if you know what that is, you know, where they had the car hops and everything. And uh, we're, that's where we'd hang out and get races. There were about four of them in the Houston area. And one was a little better than the other one on a certain night or whatever. So we'd go to different ones. And so anyway, um, <clears throat> guy was up there in a 69Z28 and I was in this fair lane. And my fair lane ran good. You have to remember on street cars, a fast car doesn't win. What wins is a car that looks slower than it is. 
That's why you make money. A 12 second car has to look like a 13 second car. 11 second car has to look like a 12 second car. And uh, I learned this at an early time. Okay. So anyway, I, I am sitting there and I got a race with a Z28 in my, no, no, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. That's close enough. Okay. Anyway, I got a race with this fair lane, took this Z28's money. Well, it turned out that he was on his way. I want to make this short. He was on his way to pick up Linda for a date and was late and I had taken his money. So he gets there. He gets there and he says, hey, she goes, there were no cell phones, of course. Why are you late? Well, I got tied up, you know, at the drive in and I lost my money and I'm late and you're going to have to pay for us to go out and eat. And it was now that's not happening. OK, so she gets in her 69 SS Hugger Orange Camaro uh, and drives to the drive in and gets out and says, who took the 69 Z28's money? And they said, that guy over there. Okay. And so she comes over and says, hey, you just took my boyfriend's money. He's going to take me out to eat and he wanted me to pay and I'm not paying. So you're taking me to eat. And that is how we met. You awesome. know, I mean, that's a true story. And we, we are 50th anniversary was, um, uh, what, three months ago? Yeah, three or four months ago. We had a big trip planned for Europe and everything, you know, and all that all went out the window. So we'll get it next year. Been married 50 years, two good kids, and a lot of wasted money on race cars, but we don't regret any of it. Yeah. So Brian and Kim are now with the school, and that's made me very happy. A lot of the uh, uh, the graduates, uh, you know, the school's going to continue on, and it's in, in you know, great hands. Uh, the other thing, just to kind of talk a little bit more about 69 Camaros is uh, – Oftentimes, when uh, you would take somebody's money, uh, they don't want a chance to win their money back. And you'd be like, uh, you know, and then Linda would pipe in, well, I'll drive the car. Yeah. And the guy's like, especially that alpha male style, he's like, oh, uh, yeah. there's no way a girl can beat me, right? And I, she'd have the car I, and she's I, going to come to see you. I, I would just go tell him, hey, my crazy girlfriend wants to race. You know, you win your money back. We'll be even. Everybody had a good time. Well, with six on the car, with six on the car, she could run within hundreds of what I could. Okay. <laughs> within a tenth, you know, street tires are a little harder to get the thing moving. Okay. But anyway, she it was just as fast with her as it was for me. But the problem was I would just get a fender on them and stay there. Okay. No, not Linda. We were going. So then they knew they'd been had. You, you know what I'm saying? It was not sometimes a real pleasant event after that, but uh, we, we had, it, it's not something we're ashamed of. And remember, we're talking about 12 second cars, not nine second cars, you know? Right. Yeah. But uh, it was a good thing. And uh, the car, you know, I've been restoring it for 40 years. It is actually completely painted with stripes on it in the body shop. Yeah, it's right. going to be another little project where I'm going to put it together myself, but they're finishing all the body work, the interior and all that stuff. Because we've thrown drive shaft. He called me up, called me up and he goes, Judd, this is a car only has 9,000 original miles on it. And he goes, Judd, he says, we're going to have a new floorboard in this thing. Well, it wasn't rusted or anything, you know? And I said, really? What's so bad about it? He says, man, these holes in the back, because we, if, you know, we threw drive shafts out back then. We didn't have good U joints. We didn't have good drive shaft. And so the whole back of it, and what I did is terrible, but I pop riveted aluminum over it and then took this tar based material and swiped it on with a brush and put the carpet over it. Yep. So he had to do all of that. But a lot yeah. of fun, you know, it was. No, that's cool. So uh, every once in a while, you'll tell me how you found this rare one of none set of OE original pistons and you've spent incredible money at some time for truly original parts to bring this thing all the way back to 69. How much does a set of pistons that you've got in that car cost? Um, you, if you can get a really, really good set and these were, they actually, they actually came. Um, let's see, who did those come from? 
those came from a very well-known, I, I get my parts mixed up. Uh, quite a few of my parts came from Jenkins because Chevrolet gave Jenkins so much, he still has shells of it, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but no, that's not where the Pistons came from. Let's see. <laughs> oh, it came from Steph's, Steph's oil pans. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, that's who they, he had them on the shelf and they had been dynoed only in 69 in a Trans Am test car and he ended up with them and we were talking about something and so I got those, but they go on eBay, you know, five, six hundred dollars for a used set. But uh, that engine just, just we did build the thing 99% stock. The only thing I cheated on was I had the torque plate on it. They did not come torque plate on. But right. We didn't do the valve job. The heads are unported. They're just like they came from Chevrolet. The manifolds, the manifold came, you know, all this is came on the 80% of it came on the car. I can't say all of it. But uh, anyway, so it, uh, it, I mean, it had, comp cams did us the original 3030 cam. Right. Um, uh, and uh, put lined up the dots and it was close, so I didn't move it. Uh, but uh, it made 366 horsepower with headers. Wow. And that's, that's cool. uh, now it has no torque. <laughs> it has like 280. 290 pound feet of torque right. about 55 5800 it starts going you know signs off about 67 68 rock and roll um, all right well we, we've covered a lot of things about the school and and you know i want to mention here the life skills part is a really big part of it um when i was there i was very idealistic and uh you know not necessarily the most well-groomed person either and you know Judd at that point was your hair is too long, cut it off. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, being representing the school and that when we leave the school, you're still representing the school as a, as a graduate. Uh, so learned a lot of uh, great life lessons in there. There were people that couldn't do math. You taught them to do math. There's people that couldn't read and you're like, you don't read cause you can't read and you can't read cause you don't read. There's all these Juddisms out there. Good, yeah. Yeah. I think there's even like a, on, you know, one of the graduate Facebook groups, you know, there's a, what's one of the, you know, Juddisms that you remember. And there's a list of 50 Juddisms out there. Yeah. So it's, it's also not just engine building, but character building. I tell people that very often, uh, very important part of just being a human being. So with that, I know we've gone way over our typical hour. Uh, what other things do you want to talk about? Cause I, I can keep going. Yeah, no, I can stay here all day. Just, you know, when you get here, uh, uh, some of this, and this is, like I say, this isn't about the schools, about your life, okay? You're treated the way you're perceived. You know, I, I'm not against long hair and all these, you know, earrings, and I really am, I guess, but, you know, I would defend to my death your right to do it. I just think it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. You don't want to impress your peers. Okay. There's one person you want to impress as people that write checks on Friday. That's it. That's who you want to impress. And then after you get rich, do anything you want. But my job is to get you hired. Okay. Right. And if you think you're going to go over to Hendrick Motorsports, there is, let me just tell you a quick story that I'm allowed to tell. Yes. You, if you're going to tear down, Okay, in the Roush Yates Cup Shop. Okay, you are going to interview with Doug Yates. Okay, that is a fact. There is no one gets hired. You go in there, and I, I, you know, I prime them for it. But you better be yes sir, no sir, thank you sir, and you better look like he looks. Right. Okay? And when you know more than he does, pierce your head. I don't care. Okay, paint your hair purple, whatever. But until you get that job, you know, I got to get you a job. And anyway, I'm not saying it's right. That's the way it is. You're going to be cheap, treated the way you are perceived, not how you are. And that's not right, but that's the world. Uh oh. Look at that. <laughs> She was a little smaller the last time you saw her. Oh my goodness. 
I'm doing a live stream. You gotta go somewhere. <laughs> and she like, I like that. One of the best parts about this whole COVID thing is you know getting oh, this. No. Yeah, the it, fans. Uh, yeah, it, it's something. I mean, this is a great experience for many of us. You know, we, you know, I've been doing nine to five forever now, and this is pretty cool that you know she's one of my little breaks during the day at this point. So anyway, um, cool. So what other things, anything else you want to hit on? Like, uh, you know, the direction that the school's going, uh, certainly, you know, working with Summit Racing, it's, it's been a really big part, you know, for us, because we really like, you know, establishing those relationships with the students, having parts in stock, you know, giving you guys good prices on stuff. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can talk about uh, the ATEC program as well, you know, there for your engine building students where, you know, they want to get into, uh, you know, the, the volume pricing and stuff. So we've got yeah. available, you know, there for your graduates. But um, what other things you want to tell us about the direction that you guys are heading? Uh, I'll just tell you this. Uh, this is, it wasn't me, you know that when I tell you, but it's really pretty cool. I appreciate anything that's done well, okay? But I just can't say I'm a drift person, you know, but I, I saw them and I'm going to tell you, it takes some ability. It does. Okay, way more. So that's all I care. So we're doing this drift car and our complete engine, okay, you know, less the block came from y'all. Those parts, um, they're awesome. I mean, yeah. just everything we got in there, we were happy with. There was no doubt. And uh, that kind of got put on the burner. We're just now getting students back in the building. Wow. We have a small number and we're keeping them set, separated. CNC's down on that end. I know you know where I'm talking about. Over there, or there. The EFI is across the street in the other building. Right. Uh, and, you know, the, and then, you know, we're keeping them divided and we do the temperature and every day. And uh, like the block class, for instance, instead of having a big block class, we have one in the morning now, one in the evening, you know. We're keeping them all separated. So far, we're still doing the Zoom, but. Uh, uh, we're getting a few more in all the time and knock on wood. Uh, you know, we check everyone every morning, all that stuff. Uh, and we've had no problems with anything so far, but, uh, uh, we're, we're going to get back. We're, we're, we're actually going to go, uh, test, um, next week, uh, for the NHRA, uh, national event that's coming to Houston. We got the car. We got the car all ready to go uh, last year, and then you know the COVID hit, and it sat in the trailer. So we took it back out, started up, ran leak down, compression check, you know all that, checked all the springs and everything, and so now it's ready to go again. Um, and we're going to go out there and test, and then see how it runs. That's exciting. How fast have you run with that car so far? Uh, we we set the FSX. NHRA record, uh, it went an 890 at 150 at 3,400 pounds, 3,450 on nine inch tires. That's awesome. 90150. Yeah, naturally, naturally right. aspirated yeah, now for all y'all guys out there. That's no blower, no nitrous, no nothing. Right. So I, I know that sometimes you drive the cars and sometimes uh, Brian drives the cars or sometimes even students have driven the cars. Who's who's uh, the lineup right now for these these cars? Brian, Brian's doing all the Copo stuff right now. And this uh, we have a 350 Z that we're putting together uh, with your engine parts. OK, that's going to be our drift car. And we haven't figured out that driver yet, but we actually. We, I didn't know how big this drifting really was. You know, so I go out there to the students, you know, they're the, the N word, right? That's hey, right. what do y'all think about doing this? Okay. Whoa, you know, okay. Yeah, let's have a drift car, right? Turns out I knew I had one that drifted. I had okay. three. Okay. okay. So we got, we're going to let one of them drive the thing. Okay. But right now, Brian drives to White Copo. It's so fast on those tires and everything, you know, we had we have to be careful with that one. Uh, but we just have a good time. Uh, we're putting together a super, our old Mustang that Pat drove naturally aspirated. Yeah. We, we put it back together. It's a pro-charged 
four valve, obviously modular based engine in it. Uh, we're just going to take it and go run it. Okay. Just to be different. You know, we just, we had too much Chevrolet stuff. Let me be honest. And still the majority is Chevrolet, but I said, Hey guys, we got to have some Ford stuff. And so that car was sitting around. And so we got a different subframe for the modular engine. And, uh, we put this thing together and I don't want to make light of it, but we torque plate honed it. Uh, we, we took, we got one junk head, went through it, you know, for about, oh, say three weeks and got a cylinder intake exhaust and combustion chamber we liked. And then we digitized that and then CNC a set of heads. And, uh, we literally opened up the comp cam catalog. Okay. And they had like a stage one, two, and three. They said, what do you want? I said, I have no idea. Okay. Stage two, where do you want it in the engine? I have no idea. Put it in straight up. We'll start there. Well, the, we ran it in, got it on the dyno and got everything warm and everything. And uh, the FI class, you know, was doing the tuning on it. Okay. Uh, anyway, on about the fifth pull, made like 1180 horsepower. I mean, it's nothing. You yeah. see why I kind of get down on blowers. I, I got to say this, that pro charger is a bad dude. Right. I mean, we just took the kit and bolted it on and here we are with 1180. So we have it in the car. Okay. We got a transmission. We have so many transmission converters, you know, okay. And we're going to go run that thing. We have, we have not been down the track with it yet, but uh, that's what we're doing. You know, we're looking at some welding courses. Uh, 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 we're, we're looking at uh, engineering technician, uh, engineering assistant technicians. That's that's a new deal that's going on right now across the country. Engineers need people to do work for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll see. EFI is going good, you know, of course. Um, uh, and that's really it. I mean, okay. same old, same old. We just you know, more buildings and more students and all that. Uh, but we still have a good time. Every one of us, you know, the students, uh, there is no, there is no long hair. There's no earrings. You know, we get by with it. I'll be honest with you for safety reasons. There is no missing. There is no late. Uh, anybody that's listening and thinks you're going to do that, you're not. You know, it's our way or the highway. And someday somebody will take us to court. We've been threatened a number of times, but you know, that did not matter. When I was a student there, you know, people would call me up and, and I was working the, basically the, the phone at that point. And I'm like, honestly, you're going to get into it, what you, you know, out of it, what you put into it, you know, and that was the biggest thing for me is, you know, I, I just went down there and just, Oh my God, I worked really hard. I ended up getting mono from it, you know, but I got more out of it than most, you know, cause I spent yeah. Yeah. The harder so, you work, I mean, we're, we're sometimes here working on race cars, you know, say we're open, oh, 50, 60 hours a week. Okay. You, we don't charge you a penny. If we're open, you're working with us. Right. Uh, yeah. Some nights we don't even go home. All right. All right. We so, go so one of the things is, you know, we like, we haven't really spoken with anybody, uh, you know, that have, has got any questions for us. Do you have any questions on your end or does, Dave Fuller on, on our end, have any questions or comments that we could answer? I don't have any over here. We're good here. All right. Well, I, I think we're pretty good on our end too, but if people have commented on, on this and they often do, what I'd like to do is invite you and Brian over there to, uh, you know, you know, feel free to comment or answer any of the comments that you see from this live stream, uh, you know, so that, uh, you know, undoubtedly there are students down there interested or potential students interested in there. And, you know, just, we wanted to open up a point of contact uh, with you guys today. Obviously we at Summit Racing, you know, love supplying you guys parts, love supplying your students with parts. Uh, it's it's one of these things where we wanna have a really long, great relationship with you. We've got the best customer service in the industry. Uh, also real quick, we should talk about some of these tech articles that we've done for you. We've, and it's a resource there for the students too, but we've collected, you know, 46 different uh, Gen 3 and Gen 4 LS and some LT engines as well. We've got spec guides out there. We've got uh, upgrade guides out there for that. We've got more specialized content out there and you can find that 
on the customer service page, if you just want to type LS2 in there or what kind of LS2 do I have? We actually have like this tree of, you know, discoveries so you can figure out what engine you had in your, you know, 2003 truck, for instance. So those are all resources for, you know, you and, and then obviously for, for Judd's students as well. Uh, Wait, let me interrupt you. Yeah. Okay. For Judd also, I use it. Okay. And the tech articles, okay, for those of y'all that don't know, I mean, they have an A list of authors, let's call it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, these are people that I know personally and they are good. Okay. They have done a great job. And I'm telling you right now that the guides you have to the LS specs and parts and all that. Uh, I mean, as soon as a student gets in here, you know, some of them hadn't been around the LS platform. Okay. Uh, or even if they have, I mean, I tell them you got to go to the summit and realize what's there in print. Yeah. The, the team that put that together uh, is a, a really great team. So some of that has been with Dave Fuller and, you know, the, the group of on all cylinders. Uh, some of that have been with another department in here that's uh, run by a, a good friend and, uh, associate of mine by the name of Jason Fott and his group actually was the, the the people that really helped us start you know the templates and writing those articles so it's an excellent resource it's going to be out there forever uh, if you just type something into Google there's a really good chance that you're going to land on the summit website article or you're going to land on the on all cylinders version of that so that content lives out there forever it's an ongoing process you know we, we talk about the, the cans the pistons the rods the cranks the HDR push rods we've got really anything that we've created under the summit brand name and, and really uh, anything you know that we carry you know people need a part you know I'm happy to you know put you in with a, a comp cam a cam motion cam a Brian Tooley cam doesn't matter whatever you need if you want it summit means to have it for you so so Jai, we appreciate your your kind words and taking the time with us I, I know that we've been you know talking about getting this lined up for a while now so I want to you know thank Brian and and Kim and and everybody there that's helping us, you know, kind of get together. We did a live stream with with Brian here maybe a couple months ago, just so I could speak with the students. And that was great. Anytime any of your students, you know, you, know, you have new batches coming through all the time. And you know, it's, it's always a pleasure for me to speak with the students and share my experiences uh, and then hopefully, you know, get some parts in their hands as well. Always, always. Awesome. So can you give them your, you've got the uh, samtech.edu uh, or what's your Samtech, website? Samtech.edu will get you to the website. Awesome. So I would really recommend, I, I did this a little bit uh, yesterday. It, it goes in depth to every one of their uh, educational programs and, it, you know, basically bullet points down through all the little subsections of cylinder heads and blocks and EFI tuning. You get to see exactly, you know, what you can learn about. It talks about the race cars, it, you know, it talks, you know, you've got your, you know, gallery of, of all your, you know, graduates that are in all these different shops. You got a full list of shops out there. So samtech.edu. And then again, uh, when you want to, you know, buy some parts, summitracing.com is the very best place to start your shopping trip. Uh, we love doing these things with you. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to put them down there and we'll do our best to answer them for you. But with that, Judd, thanks again. Hey, thank you. It was a pleasure. I appreciate you inviting me in. Awesome. And to our customers, thank you the most. Uh, you know, again, Dave Fuller, I think we're probably done for the day here, but uh, thank you for joining us.